Hey there friends, Dave Politis, k Missing Project, a copyrighted edition for our video channel. And you're watching another edition of Huck TV. Yes, Huck TV. The executive producer, the big boss, the person who has the attitude in the office. Yes, that's Huck, but we love her. And on with the show. Yes, Huck is wandering the halls here, causing trouble. <laughs> barking, keeping everybody awake. But I'm here to give you a missing person show. And uh, I've got three intriguing cases for you. Now, everyone knows we got a documentary coming. Missing 411, The UFO Connection. And uh, I am blown away by the interest shown. Our event's already sold out. The event we had for the first two movies, we doubled the size of it and we sold it out a month early. I'm humbled and I'm very appreciative for all of the support that I'm getting on this. And I think it's, it needs to be said that uh, probably need it. And why is that, Dave? Well, it's pretty easy why. <laughs> I'm not a very wealthy guy, truthfully. I'm not. But the amount of financial... <laughs> I had to hang myself out on this production was huge. Now, obviously, I kind of know the background and where we're going with it, and I know that these stories are phenomenal. So, I know it was worth the bet. But I'm still really nervous, and so is everybody around me for what's, what's happening, but the momentum is huge. Uh, we've got some stories that are going to be written for it, and some people that are showing interest at a very high level. Thank you. Uh, talk about a few related items. Mental health. The military has come out to say that the uh, mental health crisis within their ranks is a lot worse than the, what they've stated in the past. And we've all kind of known that. But to think that their recruiting is down 25% the numbers in the ranks are way down. People are not enrolling at what they did in the past. Recruiters can't meet their goals. I worry about the mental health of our young men and women. And whatever I can do to help with that, I'm going to do it. And uh, I will let you know right here, right now, that there is nothing better, better than you can do for your country than to stand and serve. And I mean serve here in the U.S. or serve overseas in the military. There was a time in our world where service to America was something that was pretty much taken for granted. I'd like to see it come back where some type of service is required. I don't care if it's public service, meaning firemen, policemen, paramedic, or if it's foreign service for a nonprofit, for the military, something along those lines. That's really what built America, was our service. And we need to get back to that quickly. Because as long as people don't want to be policemen, firemen, paramedics, it's going to cause a huge decline in our way of living. So. I worry about us as a society on the mental health side of this frame. And remember NAMI, N-A-M-I, totally free organization. I've taken a 12-week class there. It was phenomenal. I learned more in that class than I learned in any class in college. The people were outstanding. They brought in people that had various conditions and you could ask them questions and talk to them. Blew me away. Everybody needs that education that I had to have a more sensitive outlook on really what in the heck 
you are going through out there and what we are going through. So, on with the show. First letter, hey Dave, long time listener to the channel. Been with you since the very beginning, but a first time writer. I hope you, Angie and Huck are well and enjoying the changing of the weather. It is changing up here in Montana. I woke up this morning, took Huck out. It was a brisk 37 degrees. And here I am wearing my running shorts and my uh, little light top, and I thought, well, I've got to change that top. I wish we could say the same in Florida. I'm very much looking forward to the release of the new movie and wish I could be there in person for the premiere. But I'll definitely be catching it as soon as the streaming is available. It takes so much to do something on this scale, and I can't imagine how hard it has been to finish something like this with not only the state of our nation and COVID, but also the loss of Ben. May he rest in peace and be forever with you. Amen. Amen. You're very strong, Dave, and your energy is contagious. When I'm your age, I hope I can still be as much of a go-getter as you are. Well, I appreciate that compliment very much. And yes, Angie would say that I work my butt off. And when I wake up in the morning, I don't like to expect anybody I know to outwork me. And it was something my dad taught me years ago. Don't ever be outworked, Dave. Whether it's in sports and business, it'll be something everyone will admire. And why it hasn't always been, in some institutions, they don't like people that work hard, but yeah, I always work hard every day. I have a sentence in my office on the board that says, I didn't wake up to be mediocre today, but I get these waves and that's the only thing I can explain it to you. And I know other people out there get this get these waves of emotion that just take me down sometimes. It's not very common. Most commonly has to do with Ben. But I get a wave of emotion that's just overwhelming and I gotta step aside and, and the best I can say is it takes several minutes, several hours to recuperate. And the best I can describe it is this wave. And I've talked to my counselor about it a lot. She says, David, it's so common for people that have gone through tremendous loss to have those experiences. Scary thing for me. She said, you may never lose them. It may happen forever. And I'm not really looking forward to that, but something I know all of you, many of you out there have gone through. I, I, I read your letters, I, I read your posts, I know it's happening. So, got to learn to cope. That's important. Back to the letter. Praises to you and your work complete. Let me get to the story that had me thinking about it again from a few videos ago when another writer gave you a sighting they had from Maine. Quick background. I'm a native Floridian and I've always been a believer in what would be considered the paranormal. Ever since I was young, reading books in the library about Bigfoot, Mothman, UFOs and ETs, ghosts and the like, but I'd never had any experience until the middle of last September when I saw something that was really puzzling for me, now at 35 years old. This took place in the small town of Monmouth, Maine. Family and I, plus in-laws, were attending a wedding and decided to stay at an Airbnb bungalow that is right on the Cochinawagan Lake with a floating dock that goes out about 30 feet or so with a larger platform at the end. Well, after the wedding, we were all back at the bungalow 
and the family was turning in to go to sleep, but previously we had talked about going out to see the stars when it was late enough and tonight it was perfectly clear. It sounds just like our family. When you get a chance and you're in the middle of Nowheresville, like parts of Maine, where you're not near a really big city with a lot of light producing energy, and you can see the night sky, I'll leave you speechless. So many nights I've gone out and just stared at the sky. We waited until about 10 o'clock, went out front in the driveway with nothing but a small headlamp set to red and the light from our cell phones. My wife and father-in-law were using one of those stargazing maps that based on your location, you can point up to the sky and get the names of the stars and planets and other celestial objects. It was amazing to see. It was working well, but we really wanted to get a good time-lapse shot and it wasn't and it just wasn't perfect so the better idea was to head to the end of the dock with much better visibility outside of the tree cover and do it from there hoping it's stable enough we headed down there and laid down on our backs star staring at the night sky now, I haven't been out in a very rural area like this far north but without the light pollution the view of the sky and stars is absolutely amazing it totally blew my mind about how clear and vivid everything was. Sorry about that. So, we're laying down, the four of us, myself, wife, father, and brother-in-law. My phone is older, and the pictures aren't great, so I didn't even bother ha having it out. My father-in-law is trying his time lapse, and my wife is just using the stargazing app again, when she says to me, do you see that moving? I told her yes and knew immediately what she was referencing. From our viewpoint upward, laying down in the direction of our bodies, there were two objects quickly, wickedly fast from a south-southwestern angle with one in the lead. And if I guess, I held my hand out for a distance and the other hand at about hand's length distance behind and to the side. They both had no real shape, but absolutely had a glow, white, spherish light that they gave off. These were not standard jet aircraft lights and continued without blinking or changing their luminescence. When we first noticed them, I was thinking maybe a shooting star or satellite, not sure. I was just stunned. Then I knew it definitely was not any of that. After about 10 seconds of watching them move in this manner and speed, the object in the rear shot forward at a speed of almost 10 times what it had been doing and moved to be side by side with the leading object. We were still just sitting there, mentioning to my in-laws if they could see them also. Meanwhile, there's nothing present in my wife's phone app like stars or comets that would be straight up from our view. We watched for maybe another 10 seconds as the two objects were side by side, still moving very fast. I say very fast because from what we could tell, if it was something very high up with such shape, it would have been moving at speeds that we don't know anywhere from down here. Then in almost a split second blink, they both just disappeared instantly and were gone. Still tracing their movement with my eyes, I looked forward in the direction that they were totally, totally gone and not farther in that path. It was hard convinced that this was not from this earth or perhaps very advanced tech. My father-in-law kept just saying it must have been satellites. No way, Dave. To make that change in speed, then slow down to keep pace with the other, to then just vanish, no way. Myself, father-in-law, and brother-in-law are all engineers in Lockheed and have a great deal of knowledge of the products we produce. But that's not to say that this could not have been something else far more advanced. Being from Lockheed Martin, we each know who Ben Rich was, and in my opinion, his most famous quote, we already have the means to travel among the stars, but these technologies are locked up in black projects and it would take an act of God to ever get them out to benefit humanity." End of quotes. Isn't that sad? Isn't that really sad? Yeah. It was really such a crazy sight, Dave, and I'll never forget it. I still joke with my wife about it, and while she's a skeptic about a lot of things, she agrees that whatever it was, it was truly cool. This was my first paranormal experience. It only helped solidify my beliefs in the matter. That night also, I was remembering what well, you had mentioned about being in the desert out west at night and seeing amazing things. 
This was that for me. And no, it wasn't captured in the attempted time-lapse shot because of the movement of the dock. It didn't come out well. We stayed out for probably another 15 minutes on that dock and didn't see anything else after that, save for an amazing view. Thank you for all you do, Dave. Please keep up the good work. And I'm letting you know that I'm ready to follow you whichever platform or service you might move to should the situation take us in that direction. Please continue to share the stories related to all things discussed so far, including the mental health news and topics that are brought up occasionally. I never thought I'd be involved in matter until a few months ago. I want to share that I want to share that story with you in the village, but I really must take a dedicated sitting to get the subject put to paper as it was very troubling. Thanks for that story. You know, there's a lot of us that have those troubling <laughs> mental health stories. It's just one of the facts of life. Now, his story about laying on the dock in Maine and looking up in the stars. So think about your total life. How many hours your life is long? Let's just think about one work year. One work year, 40 hours a week, 52 weeks, is 2,080 hours. Well, how much of your work life do you spend on your back looking at the stars? Well, none, probably. Think about how many hours in your off-duty time do you spend looking at the stars? Probably not many. But in that instant, this man and his family, in that little fraction of a space of time in your life, they see something fantastical like that. Was it something that they were meant to see? Was it placed there? Was it on their roadmap of life to see? I don't know. I can tell you, I have spent hours and hours looking in space. And it's a rare night when I don't see something weird. It is. And I've got other friends that do the same thing. So you get the time, relax, take a deep breath. It's just stare into space the next time you're on a voyage into the backcountry. Next story. Hey Dave, I'm a big fan of all that you do. Thank you. I've had several UFO sightings in my 60 years. One caught on video, several with a still camera. Wasn't so lucky with one I'm going to tell you about right here. December 2008, traveling from my home in Green Bay, Wisconsin to a small town of Black Creek, Wisconsin, 17 or miles so from Green Bay. Not sure the exact time, but it is dark, sky is free of clouds and extremely, extremely cold. As I approached Black Creek on Highway 54, I noticed a large, very vibrant red light appeared in the sky ahead of me, like someone turned on a light switch. Then two more lights appeared, one on each side of the first light, red and very bright. Then two more appeared, one on each end, now there are five bright red lights, evenly spaced like a straight line. I decided to pull over to the side of the road, very little traffic, as I stopped and I noticed the center light, call it light number one, began to rise, and then a second or two later, the lights on either side of light one began to rise as well. Now I'm looking at five lights forming an upside down V. Sounds like the Phoenix lights. Look into it. I was stunned. The movement of the lights was fluid and in unison, as if they were all attached to some unseen structure that was tilting. The cell phone I had at the time did not have a camera, 2008, but I did have a Canon 20D in my trunk. I got it out of the car. It was extremely cold. And I was not dressed for it. No gloves, light jacket. I know better now. Got the camera from the trunk, but it could not get the thing to focus. I tried to switch to manual focus, but tiny buttons and frozen fingers are a bad combo. I looked up at the lights and noticed that lights 1, 2, and 3 were now moving back into their original position, back to a straight line, and it appeared to be getting smaller as if moving away to the west. I called County 911, made a report to the dispatcher as I watched the lights get smaller moving west. She told me they had several reports identical to mine. I headed into the small town of Black Creek. I saw two county squad cars pulling into the gas station at the main intersection in town. I pulled in and spoke to the deputies. One told me that they had at least four calls come in so far. I pointed them in the right direction and off they went. I had to keep my appointment and I would have been following them. 
I hope this doesn't this didn't take too long Dave I now live in Superior Wisconsin on the shore of the big lake I've seen some crazy stuff in the night sky I always keep a camera with me and the cold weather clothing thank you for all you do be safe yeah that description reminds me a lot of what I saw of the Phoenix lights and I've seen videos of it and a lot of stills look it up Phoenix lights Next letter. Hey Dave, I'd like to start by saying how much your work and personal experience has given me a sense of belonging. The village is a powerful community and I greatly appreciate you reading the chosen experiences and thoughts of this incredible group of like-minded inquisitive people. You're on, you and Ben are constantly in my prayers and thoughts and not a day goes by that I don't think about you both. That makes two of us. Between 1955 and 57, my father was a Boy Scout here in Albuquerque. His uncle was a scout leader, heavy drinker, so the boys were typically left unsupervised during their wilderness excursions. During one overnight outing, my father and his best friend were separated from their troop during a heavy rainfall, which flooded a gully in the Sandia Mountains just east of the city. They were forced to look for an alternate route to reach the rest of the boys, and the area was in is littered with huge granite boulders. They decided to move up the mountain where less water had collected and according to both now elderly men, it was one of the biggest lightning storms they'd ever been in. As they reached what looked like the safest path to move farther south where they had last seen the group, they came upon a large outcropping of boulders bordered by a granite cliff face. Both men still tell the same story to this day. They claim lightning struck a tree a few hundred yards up the mountain. And shortly after, they both heard what sounded like giant flat stones or metal slabs loudly grinding against each other. This lasted a few moments, and as they heard the sound, they looked towards the cliff face to see what appeared to be a pitch black square opening in the stone. They described it as large as the side of a barn with perfectly straight lines on all four sides. They took a few steps back and waited to see if anything would emerge from the dark opening, but saw absolutely nothing. No light, no objects, no people, nothing. Almost as soon as it opened, it began to shut again. The boys ran back down the mountain and equally found their way to the scout leader's truck. They didn't speak about it again for many years and feared that they'd be ridiculed. You can still see the look of wonder on their faces when they recall the incident. Just glad my dad is still around to tell it. My father is of German descent, and based on the number of missing person cases you've covered with people of similar ancestry, I've always been compelled to reach out and tell you their story. I've sat down with both men separately over the years to see if their stories matched, and since I'm a young boy, they've explained the same details every time. This may sound like a stretch, and forgive me if this has been brought up before, but I've got a theory of what may be of interest based on the number of cases you've researched, which include water, granite, and climate weather conditions. Could it be possible that something failed in an attempt to engulf the boys into some other realm? It was raining heavily in a huge granite outcropping with lightning striking extremely close to them. Could it be possible that some of the Piezoelectricity occurs in the granite, which affects the crystals contained in the granite, as well as the biological matter in the bones, DNA, and proteins in the human body. Perhaps the perfect conditions are being met in the cases you research, which allow for portals to open briefly, allowing the victims to simply walk in, fall, or be pulled into them. Like the ideal factors are accidentally put in play and make these people seemingly disappear into thin air. I'm not an expert. However, I've studied biochemical and bioelectric properties and pathophysiology and biochemistry, which made me develop these questions. I didn't put two and two together until learning about your research over the last couple of years. New Mexico is a very mysterious place, and I've always wondered why Sandia National Labs and Los Alamos built and remain in operation in this high desert location. The place where my father and his friend had this experience is only a mile away from Sandia Labs. So I've always wondered if there was a connection to the government research. I could be all wrong here and probably am, but the story itself seemed fitting for the village and I've always wanted to pass it along. Let me know what you think. If you have any 
If you happen along this email, I'd love to hear from your thoughts. You're a great man, Dave, and I look forward to any future work you put out in this world. Keep researching for the truth. We all appreciate it more than you know. Thank you. I did reach out to the, this individual at several other questions. I also wanted to know if his dad was still alive, because that is a fascinating story. And it encompasses a couple things, weather and granite and water because it was raining. The other part of it kind of reminds me of something that they saw at Skinwalker Ranch where like a window frame opened. Next letter. Hey Dave, I hope you're doing well. I heard your new YouTube update today on missing people cases. The New Jersey case I took particular interest in because I lived most of my life in New Jersey. That was the case about David Bird, a writer. I did it on a couple of videos back. I would say New Jersey is probably a hotspot because of two factors. One, we have some of the highest number of walking trails per the population, many wildlife reservations, and New Jersey is the state with the highest population density in the U.S. When you combine these two factors, you get a lot of potential sightings. Two quick related additional notes. I saw an orb while driving from New Jersey to upstate New York. The sighting was along Route 17, Delaware County, New York, 15 years ago. 7 a.m., I was on my way to Sumner Retreat at a favorite Buddhist monastery. I was doing prayers and chanting mantras, so my consciousness felt very clear and spiritual. I was located about 100 feet above ground, very close to the highway. So I was as close as I could drive up that highway. Being in a rural area, I had a nice long look at it while driving probably 30 to 60 seconds before I passed it. It was about twice as wide horizontally as it was vertically. The really surprising thing was my state of mind. I remember thinking, oh, there's a UFO. But instead of being excited or scared, I felt like it was absolutely normal. Same feelings I would have just looking at things like mountains and trees. Totally normal, not unusual. Maybe it was able to make a feel this way telepathically. Like it was nothing unusual, and so I just kept driving. Also remember it visually fluctuating, hard to describe. Maybe the perception I was having might have been more than my mind could fully process or it was phasing in and out. Although it didn't fully vanish, also it was very difficult to say the color. I just remember thinking it was a silver and more, not more like a rainbow than back to silver. I'm thankful for seeing it because once you see one, there is no longer a question about its existence. I don't need to rely on expert opinions on whether these things exist or not. I'm grateful for knowing for myself. Lastly, there's a legend of UFOs that live in the Wanak Reservoir in northern New Jersey. It's a long reservoir with two large mountain ridges running north-south and a deep valley in between where nobody can really access see Wanak River, W-A-N-A-Q-U-E. However, a major highway, Route 287, runs through the reservoir. And according to old stories I've heard, the UFOs will fly in and out of that reservoir. This has been spotted by people who drive on 287. Anyways, keep up the great work. As I have stated hundreds of times, the relationship between UFOs and water is tight. Pay attention to it. Hey Dave. I'm fairly new to the community, but I've been observing Sasquatch documentaries and your Missing 411 movies as well as your channel for some time. I've been working out some theories and want to present them here to the community for some thought. When it comes to Sasquatch, it seems like they completely elude modern technology when it comes to trail cameras and the like. But when it comes to the Gimlin video back in the day, it seems like they were capable of capture something significant. Maybe it has something to do with the primitive technology and somehow that didn't trigger the creature. I wonder if we went back to the primitive reel-to-reel -reel camera of camera technology, maybe we could capture more. Good point. Also, you have mentioned and I have observed from others that orbs seem to want to be observed, especially when it comes to Skinwalker Ranch. Why do some phenomena want to be observed while others such as Sasquatch do not? Also, with the recent San Diego phenomena, such as triangular lights in the skies that hover for minutes or more, seem like they want to be observed. 
Why would UAPs have lights on them at all? Seems like they want to be seen and are curious about our observation. Anyway, lots to think about, and I wonder if some phenomena elude observation while others seem to crave it. Thanks for all you do, and I appreciate your hard work. Now, I've always said, why do some UFOs have lights? Now, that doesn't make sense. Unless they are so smart that they put lights on to be associated with craft on Earth, and you would just, yeah. Okay, that's an Earthbound craft. I'm not interested. I don't know. Hey Dave, this comes from a friend of mine, by the way. Skinwalker Ranch Theory. It's a prison for spirits. By spirits, I mean people separated from bodies or people with no need of bodies who exist in spirit form. For some reason or reasons, they were captured and packed into a prison transport craft and placed under the ridge at Skinwalker Ranch. I couldn't help wondering what might get released on the Skinwalker show last season if the drilling equipment that was stopped by a very hard obstacle under the ridge broke through that obstacle. So you possibly have billions of spirits packed away under the ridge attended by various entities that work for the galactic prison system. We humans have been are annoying, but they figure we just need to be monitored so we are so persistent and don't leave in spite of their efforts to scare us off. Why don't they just kill us? Maybe galactic cops, prison guards operate under some form of galactic law that doesn't allow them to do so? Maybe the creatures arriving by vortex travel are just coming to work. Maybe the huge dogs, cats are their version of Huck and the orbs are automated patrol units. Drones, you said. Maybe some off-duty guards pack the Gorman's bulls into the small trailer just to mess with the humans for entertainment during a break and place Mrs. Gorman's groceries back in their grocery bags, etc. Obviously, they can manipulate time and physical reality, so it's easy to do their pranks. Thanks for your great content, and yes, definitely includes the letters and the mental health info. What's the point of stuffing bowls inside of a trailer so they're like sardines? What would be the, boy, the point of a young boy riding by a young calf stuck in the mud and saying, I'll come back in a little bit, and that boy coming back 20 minutes later and seeing that the calf is mutilated? What would be the point other than studying the, obs studying the reaction the boy had to the event? Something so far beyond me, I, I don't get it. So, the three stories today. A long time ago, I talked about this story briefly. I've talked about it at conferences, too. And it's an Australian case. So, my Australian friends out there, I love your country. I love it. Beautiful place, beautiful people, great food, very hospitable, an outstanding place to watch wildlife and hike the trails. This man's name was Warren Meyer, 57 years old. This is Warren. Now, Warren was 57, disappeared on March 23rd, 2008, a fairly recent case. He disappeared on a place called Dom Dom Saddle outside of Fernshaw, Victoria. Uh, just north east of Melbourne. He was on holiday with his wife and his friends at a cabin in Healesville. He told his friends that uh, the next morning he was going to get up early, park at a trailhead and take a couple hour hike and be back by one o'clock for lunch with the group. So he took his white Subaru station wagon, parked it at the trailhead at 7.30 it was just a short 15-minute drive from the cabin to the trail. He was a very, very experienced outdoorsman. He was in great shape. He planned to be gone for three or four hours, no more. And like I said, he had a scheduled lunch with his wife and, fam and friends. 
Now, Warren was a worldwide hiker. He had been all over the world. He knew what to carry. He had paper maps, GPS, whistle, matches, food, water, compass. People knew where he was going and when he'd be back. He did everything right but one thing. Just one. He didn't carry a personal locator beacon. And that's sad. Well, he was supposed to be back for that one o'clock lunch. He didn't. And all the friends that he was supposed to meet, they grouped together and they drove out. And uh, I'll show you the location. This is Dom Dom Saddle right here where he parked his vehicle. This is the cabin he was staying at in Healesville. This is Melbourne. This is water. Lots of water in this area as well. Very thick and very lush. A beautiful hike for sure. Well, his family gets there. They go out on the trail, they search for a bit. At the end of the night, he doesn't come back, they call search and rescue. And in Australia, they do things big. The search was huge. Uh, one of the first things they did is they pinged his cell phone and it pinged once right near the trailhead. Well, that didn't help. So they put up helicopters and drones. They brought in canines and ground pounders. They debrief the family. What are we dealing with here? Is this somebody with mental health issues? Not at all. Is this somebody who was fragile? Not at all. Very good hiker. Knew what he was doing. Very experienced. So helicopters are flying. People are hiking around looking for him. They also said that he would not go off trail. He was somebody that would stay on the trail and not be in trouble. Well, as they're doing the investigation into Warren and understanding the circumstances surrounding his disappearance, they start to get information into the police that on March 22nd, the day before Warren disappeared in this area, there was almost what sounded like automatic gunfire. Nobody had complained. It was just a comment that it was unusual. And then they go back and talk to the same people and they say, well, also on the day he did disappear, there was also a lot of automatic gunfire. Hmm. Okay. Please make their notes in their file. It's fine. Well, there's an eight day search, hundreds of people, tens of thousands of dollars spent and they found nothing. Nothing. Well, months of investigations, and they find out that there is a psychiatric patient, patient that disappeared and was seen in this area where Warren was hiking. Now, this patient had suicidal and homicidal ideations. The police discounted it and said that they didn't think that they, they were in the same area at the same time. The person who had escaped ended up taking his life, and the police said it was unrelated to what happened. They also thought that the gunshots were unrelated to Warren. So there was a lot of people from the press trying to put Warren in a little pig hole so that they could just forget about it. Well, it's been 14 years now. Hundreds and thousands of people have walked up and down that trail. His family said he wouldn't have gone off trail. Okay, if he wouldn't have gone off, then where did he go? His car's parked there. He didn't leave in that. This place is out in the middle of nowhere. He's not walking anywhere. So a lot of keep, people kept pushing this idea that maybe he was murdered. Okay, it could happen. Friends, you gotta remember something. Warren was just uh, just a tad under 6'2", probably about 200 pounds. I don't care how good a shape you are. 
you're not carrying somebody 200 pounds very far in the wilderness at all. Take that out of your thinking caps. Not going to happen for the normal man to carry somebody that big. It ain't going to happen. So, let's pretend you did kill somebody and you buried him. Well, that'll solve the problem. Nobody will find him. Uh, not true. See, we have something called cadaver dogs, and they can smell a dead body 10 feet down in the ground. So that wasn't it. If he was just killed and his body was left there, guaranteed the dogs would have found it. So he said he'd be back by 1.30. And he said that that'd be the latest. And he said that he, would, he was planning on a two to three hour, maybe a four hour hike. So that meant from the point of his car, march off two hours into the bush, and then draw a line, a circular line around that point at his car, and that's your search zone. Now I may search other places, but that technically would be the search zone. A very confined area, and if you're using a helicopter with FLIR, in those first couple of days, you should be able to find the body, or it should be able to find him alive. Now, there were also news reports stating that there were marijuana grows in the area. I laugh at those. Here's why. People who grow marijuana do not <laughs> want other people snooping around. They do not. Because when others are snooping around, then their marijuana is going to get found out. They're going to lose all their hard work. They just want people to go away. So, a lot of things can be done that, but they will never hurt anybody in that attempt. Why? Because if somebody's murdered, or somebody disappears in an area, thousands of searchers are going to inundate the area. They're going to find the weed patch, and they're going to call the police, and you're going to lose all your effort. No. People that guard weed patches only will be violent towards people that they think are trying to steal their crop. Now, Warren was not one of those people, and he didn't look like one of those people. Older man, gray hair, hiking attire, no. Not going to happen. Sorry. And, uh, that isn't my personal opinion. That would be the opinion of most seasoned law enforcement people that are working in those areas. So, what happened to Warren Meyer? That's a million dollar question. 14 plus years, nothing of his is ever found. He's in a confined area. One last thing, the day that Warren disappeared, later in that day, the weather changed and it started to rain. It was a huge one. So, Australia, Victoria, place I spent a lot of time. Made a lot of great friends. I miss you guys, hope you're doing well. So the next disappearance, Happened in Arizona, not that long ago, September 30th of this year, 2022. Jeff Stombaugh, 63 years old, from Tucson. He told a group of friends that he was going to go hiking. He was an avid outdoorsman, in good shape. Made a reservation at uh, the Granite Basin Campground for September 27th through the 29th. On the 27th, he texted some friends inquiring if they'd like to meet up and hike. Well, he liked to hike that Prescott National Forest area. So where is that? That's a good question. This is Prescott, Arizona. These are the mountains. And Jeff was at the trailhead, at the Metate trailhead in entering the granite mountain wilderness area right here. Here we go with granite again, see? Now 
Now there's Jeff. So he disappeared. He spends his time camping there the 27th through the 29th. And then on the 30th, on his day he's going to leave, he's going to take one last hike, and he goes to the uh, camp host and says, hey, my phone needs charging. Would you man tr mind charging it? The host says, no problem. Jeff says he parks his car. Jeff does park his car at that Matate trailhead and walks into the wilderness. The next day he hadn't come back. The host calls search and rescue. And the area is described as rugged, steep, boulder-ridden granite. Multiple trails are fed off of this one trailhead. And search and rescue covered all of them with drones, with helicopters, with canines, multiple days. They brought in a series of 100 ground pounders and they just worked the area incessantly. Problem was, there isn't a lot of place to go up there. They found nothing. Now Jeff was talking to friends before he just went up there. He loved the outdoors. He was comfortable in them. Him going there was not unusual in the least. And him traveling alone wasn't unusual either. Well, the U.S. Forest Service, the Sheriff's Department, and Yavapai Search and Rescue were the main jurisdictions on this case. This is very similar to other cases I've researched in New Mexico where seemingly a mature person in good shape disappears off a known trail and is never found. Now many of you ask me, well why don't you give us newer cases and newer cases? I can't make cases up. Now this one is one of those cases that I scratch my head over. He should have been found. I don't get it. Now, that area that he disappeared in, I will tell you this. So this is Prescott right here. This is a trailhead. This is a mountain range that kind of loops around down in this area. There are other people who have disappeared in this mountain range and have never been found. So this isn't a first. It probably won't be the last. Now, the next case, really, really strange. And it involves a man named Bert Aldridge, 62 years old, missing August 21st, 1937, Linville Township, North Carolina, and very close to the Tennessee border. Bert was a bear hunter. That was his, that was his life. And he moved to this area near Linville about five months earlier just to be closer to the bears. Hunted them all the time. So a neighbor reported seeing Bert August 21st in his front yard. Waved at him, made contacts, hello. And nobody saw him after that. Well, on the 23rd of August, Bert's son, called Doc, he returned from a two-week trip and he walked up to his house and found it unlocked and nobody was home. His dad's truck was in the driveway and behind his dad's house, there was a lot of trails. So, let me kind of give you the overview. So, Charlotte, North Carolina, the Linville Gorge Wilderness, which is just a hop and a skip from where he disappeared. And this is Great Smoky Mountain National Park that has had more strange things happen in it than I could ever tell you in an hour. But the distance, not that far. And then this is the state line right here. Now a little close-up picture. His cabin was just on the outskirts of Linville Township. His body was found near the Linville Gorge on a trail up above the gorge. And what happened? Well, Doc searches the house, searches the property, 
and it stopped because all the rifles for his dad's and his pistols are in the house and he knew his dad wouldn't go out hunting and wouldn't go out on the trails without a gun so he decides to search searching the trails looking for his dad so three days after doc or a couple days after doc gets home he decides to go out on the trail and a half a mile down the trail half a mile from the nearest road comes across a gruesome scene eight feet down the trail down the hill from the trail sees his dad but remember half a mile from the nearest road no firearms his dad was the optimum outdoorsman doc said there's no way he would have fallen off that trail so doc goes down checks his dad's dead and he calls the police and before he left he checked his dad over and said yeah there's no visible signs of injury no gun blast no nothing and police get there and they handle the scene like a crime scene which is smart because i think that's what it was but a crime of what so doc found his dad on the 24th on august 31st headlines are mystery death bear hunter unexplained no cause found for fatal chest injuries ribs and seven vertebrae are broken not by a fall that's what the article state and his collarbone is torn from his chest from his breastbone with no external bruising and he essentially has a crushed left chest the coroner said that no man he knows of could walk any distance with those type of injuries but he prefaced that by saying that he didn't think the fall down the hillside caused the injuries that caused his death And then the coroner was asked in coroner's jury about, well, why did Bert die? He didn't know. Couldn't figure it out. And then he was asked to explain what happened to Bert. How did he end up down the trail? How did he get all these injuries? How did he end up a half a mile or a mile from his house without his gun? Coroner didn't have an explanation. And most of the articles called it a huge mystery. And Doc wasn't buying any of it. And what do I mean by that? Doc knew that his dad was a nuts and bolts kind of guy. Smart, outdoorsman, knew his way around. He knew that if he was going to get himself into a situation, he'd have to get himself out alone. Which is why when he went out that door, he carried a gun. Which is why when Dave goes out that door, he's got a gun. I know when I'm in these out of the way places, it's me against whatever's out there. Just like Bert. Now, in today's world, not much is going to be different from what happened here on Bert's case. Coroner's jury, opinions, and then forget it. Don't talk about it. It's unusual. We don't really want to know what happened. To get the collarbone torn from the breastplate, that is not easy, friends. That takes enormous force. What could do that? I have no idea. I will tell you this, that the methodical way they went about this case made a lot of sense to me. I almost tend to think that Bert was at home when something happened. Because like his son said, he wouldn't have gone off on that trail without a, without a firearm. So that meant you had to catch him outside of his home somewhere. 
Now, it's interesting because the coroner stated they didn't believe that there was any foul play. <laughs> okay, but I can't really explain those wild injuries he has to his chest. And yeah, there's no foul play. Local reports for local consumption. Let's ease everybody's interest and in pain around here. Nothing unusual happened, just let it go. That's exactly what it is. And it still is happening today all the time. As I've told you before, a detective named Gannon in New York coined that phrase, and I love it. So why did I tell you about that Bert Aldrich case because I have several other cases just like that yeah unknown cause of death I have one case that one of these days I'm going to talk to you about it I've written about it in my books so if you read the books you know about it where a hunter disappeared and he was found much later and his entire chest was crushed very much like birds but it was crushed and you know what the coroner said crushed his chest a bear so the homework assignment for you is to go out and find how much crunching power do the front paws of a bear have Yes, I could tell you, but you may not believe it. Go find out and tell me in a, in a note on this video. When I read it, I almost fell out of my chair laughing. Come on. I don't know what they were trying to hide, but they were trying to hide something. But there's been other instances just like this one I told you about. And really, this did not get a lot of publicity around the nation. It's mostly just a small newspaper in North Carolina, and I think it was a couple articles in Tennessee. And then it was just forgotten. I do think that Bert was a really, really sharp man based on everything I read. And I don't think that he made any mistakes to get himself into this situation. I think it was just very fluky set of circumstances that took his life. I'm not sure what, but someday we may know. So those are the three cases. Think about them. Just don't forget about them and go to sleep. Think about them a little bit. These are people's lives. Warren Meyer, at 57 years old, he disappeared and his wife never had a husband again 14 years ago. He was in good health, kept himself in good shape. What happened to him? What happened to Jeff Stalmba? Our world is a strange place. And until we open our minds and understand that not everything is explainable, and we understand that everything in the woods isn't friendly, until we recognize those two points, disappearances will always continue, strange deaths will continue to happen, and I'll probably be here in front of you a long time into the future. Probably not on this platform though. <laughs> so, last bit, be nice to your fellow man. If you think about the way neighboring countries are treating one another in some parts of the world, we need to be friendly to one another. And that's not hard to do. It's not. Greet people with a smile and a hello. Hold the door open. Be a good person. When you write notes, be friendly if you're contradicting somebody else or challenging someone. It's okay. Just be friendly about it. And uh, know from the bottom of my heart, I appreciate you being here. 
and contributing. If you could put this on your social media, please do. The trailer for Missing 411, if you could put that on your social media, that would be a blessing. Remember, it's free to watch. And hopefully, I'll be back with you soon. Politis out. <laughs>